Hi everyone, I'm Alice Sturrock. Um, thanks for sticking around for our little talk. Um, so I wanted to move on from that video to give you some actual examples of how we have been doing this in the real world. And so uh, my name's Anna Sturrock, I'm a lecturer at the University of Essex and previously I was at UC, uh, University of California Davis where I'll be showing you some of the research that we were doing with salmon there. So my research focuses on animal movement and here you can see some humpback whales and their movement from, can I do this? The poles where they're feeding, lots of nutrient rich waters, down to the tropics where they have their babies. And the babies don't have much blubber so they need it to be warm so it's the best way that they can get maximum fitness so they can survive and their, their juveniles will survive, their offspring will survive too. Oh sorry. That's fine. So why do these movements actually matter from an ecological perspective? Well these ocean travellers and their poop, which sounds funny, but actually whale poop is a really important fertiliser for our oceans and for the plankton that need them. Those ocean travellers connect different ecosystems. They also connect countries and continents. And that you know, gives its own issues in terms of managing them because suddenly we need to make friends across whole global scales and to manage them properly. So here's an example of a tuna that crossed the Pacific, I think it was three times in 600 days. Um, so that's vast, vast distances. Uh, these uh, movements also connect the sky and the sea floor. So the biggest migration on Earth happens every single day in terms of biomass. They're called diurnal vertical migrations. The plankton will go up to the surface to feed at night time when they're less likely to be eaten, but things do follow them. Also, those um, ocean travellers, they connect the land and the sea. So you can see, this is an example close to my heart, a bear eating a salmon. So that salmon went to the sea, derived all these lovely nutrients, loads of body fat, and then the bear is now basically getting that marine food. And some of the best wines you can drink from California have been fed by those rotting salmon carcasses on the, the river sides. And so that kind of, the transfer of nutrients from fresh water to salt water and vice versa is really important. Why does fish movement matter? Well, quite a lot of people like fish fingers. And so if we know where fish are and when, and we know which of those habitats are really important, then we can put protection measures in place, like marine protected areas. And that means we can support the fisheries and get more fish fingers. <laughs> so but how do we track animals? We talked about this a bit in the video, but in terms of tracing animals, domestic animals, we've been doing this for a very, very, very long time. Branding cattle, um, nowadays we, we micro-trip our pets usually, so we know where they're from. But in terms of tracking wild animals, that's a bit more recent phenomenon. And so, you know, back in the day, everyone noticed that a lot of birds would disappear in the wintertime. And everyone's like, what is going on? And there were lots of wild theories out there. You know, some people thought they transformed into frogs and mice and other birds. Other people thought they hibernated in the water. But then the Feilstorch turned up in Germany. And this stork came back with injury from an arrow that was clearly from Africa. And suddenly they're like, aha, they migrate really far every winter to go and spend uh, the warmer, these warmer times on the, in the kind of wintering grounds. And so that was kind of one of the first examples of, a, of an unintentional tagging event. Nowadays, they're much more intentional. And so some of the work that CFAS does, and you can probably find out more about that in their tent there, is doing really nice work with mark recapture. So you mark the fish in some ways. Here we've got a disc tag attached to a shark, and that's a tiny little tag in the nose of a baby, baby salmon. So now we know where we released it and where we recovered it. We don't know anything about in between. So now we've also got these GPS tags and uh, data storage tags where you get those individual movement patterns. We get the pathway, which is really fascinating and very cool. But you can see the size of those tags, they're pretty big. We can't put that on a baby fish. And so this is where my kind of uh, technology comes in quite handy. So I tend to use what we call natural tags and biochronologies. So you can see I've opened up the skull of a rockfish there and I've taken out the otolith. So these are the ear stones of the fish. They need them in order to be able to hear and to stay upright. Um, and you can see they're really beautiful crystalline structures. And then when you slice them through the middle, you can see these beautiful growth rings, just like a tree trunk. And so you can count those growth rings and find out how old the fish. And there's actually a, a little exhibit over there where you can guess the age of the fish just there in that tent there. So go and have a go. You can actually age your own fish. And so this is really important in fisheries management to make sure that we know how many fish we can take out of the ocean sustainably. But 
also, the width of those rings tells us how fast the fish was growing at different ages. And also, the chemistry tells us about where the fish was growing at that point in its life, what it was eating, how warm it was, and so on. And so this is the stuff that I do, and I get a laser <laughs> to uh, take tiny, tiny samples across these growth rings. Sometimes there'll be five micron diameter holes. They're really quite small, but it allows us to reconstruct those movements across their whole lifetime. Uh, so <laughs> I also take eyeballs out of fish and I peel the island layers and suddenly you're like, what has my life become? I thought I was going to be hugging dolphins and in fact I'm killing a lot of fish and pulling out various body tissues. So, you know, you never know where you'll end up as a marine biologist. Um, so I just wanted to move, just give you one example of this in action. So this is some of my work in California where I was living for the last eight and a half years. Um, the American River here is right next to the capital city of Sacramento. And we're looking at the Chinook salmon, the king salmon. They can grow kind of two meters long, maybe I'm exaggerating, but they're massive. Um, and we want to know, these are the ones that came back to spawn. They, they, they all die when they spawn, so I don't have to feel guilty about killing anything. We just dig out their otoliths from the rotting salmon carcass. <laughs> and then we can reconstruct what they did as babies. Okay, so... To give you some context, we've got basically kind of three habitats here that we're talking about. We're using this particular marker, the Otoliths Trontium isotopes, and we've got the American River, where the fish was born, basically, and we've got the Delta, where it has to go through in order to get to the ocean, and then we've got the ocean. And here you can see the Otoliths with the holes of that laser, those laser beams. And so here we can see that that little baby fry is growing in the gravel, and we're looking across time now. And so it's from the American River, but it didn't stay there very long at all. It quickly nipped out and spent about three months rearing and eating bugs in the delta. And then it got, became a smolt and it went to the ocean. So we can tell that from that one otolith. And when we do that with a lot of otoliths, we get something that looks pretty crazy like this. Each strand of spaghetti tells us about that individual fish's life. And I just wanted to point out here that we've got examples from that same river I just showed you. We've got examples, lots of the fish that left early, but we also see quite a lot of fish that left quite a lot later, and that's really, really important. It's something we don't think about a lot of the time, is that that diversity in people's behavior, in fish's behavior, in all animals, they've got this in, within species diversity in behaviors. And that is so important as, the climate, as climate change is changing the world around us, we need that resilience, we need that diversity so that um, we have the winners and losers in different scenarios. And I love this quote, the rapid loss of intraspecific variation is a hidden biodiversity crisis. It's quite wordy, but when we talk about biodiversity crises, we think about species going extinct. But actually, it's also the loss of those kind of variation in behaviors is really important. It usually precedes a species going extinct. So we need to know about these different behaviors, and the way we can get that is from natural tags and telemetry and other types of tagging. So, my take-home messages are that intraspecific, that win within species diversity is super important. Migratory species are really vulnerable because they do rely on all these different habitats to complete their life cycle. And then finally, come and talk to me and Nick on our Ocean Traveller stand, where we've got a really cool video game called The Maze of Misfortune, where you can pretend to be a salmon or a turtle or a narwhal, and you've got to try and breed safely without getting eaten or killed by a plastic bag. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Over to Michael. <laughs> Cheers.